Awesome, right. Well, I'll start off. I'm sure there'll be a few people like trickling in. Um, but yeah, just to introduce me, myself, I, I'm Sam, one of the co-founders of Severa. Thank, thanks everyone for, for dialing in, for sparing the time, really appreciate it. Um, for anyone who's unfamiliar with us um, or why we're hosting the event, Silvera is a, a carbon intelligence platform that helps you identify and evaluate high quality carbon credits. Our goal is to bring transparency and confidence to carbon markets through independent and in-depth project assessments, which are driven by our machine learning, geospatial data um, assessments and our expert analyst team. Well, yeah, th thanks so much for joining. Um, as you're probably aware, you, you, you might have seen it online. We've been doing some analysis on the, on the carbon markets and prices for carbon credits have been increasing uh, very rapidly in the last year, along with, with demand. And we've undertaken an analysis of the market to better understand what's driving demand and what the implications for the market are. So um, to kick off, I'm, I'm gonna ask our strategy lead, Oli Goff, to, be, um, to give us a bit of an introduction and, and, and some thoughts on, on the market report we, we released. So yeah, over, over to you, Oli. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. My name is Oli, and I work as the strategy lead here at Silvera. Um, and for the next 10 minutes of your lives, I'm going to share with you some of the research we've been doing on the voluntary carbon market. Now, before we get cracking, I want to highlight one technical caveat that we need to keep in mind. Specifically, the data we're looking at here is from the Vera registry. The reason we don't include data from other registries is we think the assumptions um, needed to be able to aggregate her could end up kind of raising more questions than actually providing answers. Um, however, if you want a rough estimate for how to extrapolate from the from Vera to the entire market, you can use the heuristic that Vera constitutes roughly 60% of the voluntary market and scale from there. So kicking off. The first graph I want to share with you is of cumulative volumes of issuance and retirements on the Vera registry. And for those of you unfamiliar with those terms, issuance means a developer formally registers a credit with the registry, which includes the payment of a fee. This creates a tradable credit that can be exchanged between parties. Retirement is when one of those issued credits is exercised and used to net off against a company's or individual's gross emissions. Now, now, the story here is that activity on the Vera registry has boomed over the last two years, with uh, issuance and retirement volumes increasing by 275%. Now, let's spend a couple of minutes unpacking the main pivots behind this increased activity. The first trend we want to draw attention to is the increase in the number of large retirees on the Vera registry. So what you're looking at here is the number of retirees that have retired between 50,000 to 200,000, 200,000 to 800,000, and more than 800,000 in a year. And we've displayed this for 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. And the takeaway here is that the number of large retirees has almost double every year. And if we dig a little deeper into the data, we can see that the new, organ that new organizations are entering this market at scale on done. So if we take the 64 organizations who have retired in excess 200,000 credits in 2021, we can see that 40 of them were first time retirees, um, including large uh, household brand names such as Netflix, Audi, Air France, Goldman Sachs, and Espresso. Now, this increase in the number of whales in the market is the output of the growing number of net zero commitments being made by organizers across the globe. They're realizing that although they need to make steep cuts to their gross emissions, carbon credits will be instrumental to their net zero trajectory. And we believe that this trend is really only in its infancy and will only accelerate as more companies feel pressured uh, and see the benefits of making and delivering on net zero commitments. The second dynamic I'd like to highlight has been the dramatic increase in issuance volumes over the last couple of years. Now, remember the issuance of credits requires a, de a developer to make a payment to the registry. So it's only rational for, rational for developers to uh, issue credits when they already have a buyer lined up. Who exactly owns these issued credits is unknown and cannot be discerned from the data. However, conversations with various market participants suggest two key sources of this activity. One, 
hedge funds, commodity trading firms, and brokers speculating on this market, expecting prices to increase going forward, and two, astute corporations who are aware of the significant exposure they face to the price of carbon, who are exploring ways to de-risk this exposure. In response, some have started to buy and hold credits ahead of when they need them, locking in today's low prices with the intention to retire them later. Finally, if those two dynamics weren't enough to drive up demand, at the tail end of Q3 last year, we saw the inception of various projects that used their credits as building blocks for their coins and tokens. This drove retirement up by an additional 15%, putting further strain on supply and demand dynamics. Now, recently, we've seen a slight cooling in the number of credits being brought on chain. However, it's important to bear in mind the market cap of crypto assets today is roughly $1.8 trillion, or in other words, 1,800 times the size of the voluntary carbon market. So even small fractions of capital being deployed from this part towards the voluntary carbon market has the potential to completely overturn supply and demand dynamics. We think the uh, that we think that this scenario um, is currently underestimated by the market today and could lead to further increases in demand in the medium to long term. So having touched on demand, let's shift to the other side of the seesaw and talk about supply. Now, this graph is very similar to the first graph we discussed, with the only thing that we've plotted cumulative permittance alongside cumulative issuance and retirement. Now, this encapsulates the total number of credits that developers can issue onto the market, or in more domain-specific language, it's the total number of credits across all vintages. What this graph is showing us is that for the last decade, permittance has increased year on year, and, the, and that the annual increase in permittance has been larger than the activity on the market, meaning developers' stocks of issuable credits were increasing. However, since around 2020, this trend has gone into reverse, with permittance now struggling to keep up with demand. You can see this trend more clearly through our concept of developer inventory, where we define developer inventory to be the total number of admitted credits minus issued and retired credits. Now, this doesn't mean that the supply of credits on the secondary market is falling. Actually, it's saying the reverse. As we showed in our previous graphs, volumes of credits being brought onto the secondary market is only accelerating. And right now, retirements are not keeping pace with this. The point we're emphasizing is that the rate of issuance onto the secondary market is currently unsustainable. And once developer, developer inventories are fully exhausted, market participants will have to compete on the market. Buying credits from speculators will expect a significant premium. The last point I'd like to make in this presentation is to highlight the pace at which the market is taking off today. The graph here plots the year-on-year -year change in developer inventory, indicating that somewhere around 2020, the market dynamics shifted such that the inventory started falling rather than growing. When we first released uh, our prior version of this research in Q2 of last year, we included some forecasts on how inventory uh, we expect to change for 2021, with green being the most conservative and red the most aggressive. However, when we actually ran the analysis at the end of the year, what we discovered was that actuals had blown our forecasts out of the water, with inventory having fallen several, several multiples of our estimates. What this highlights is how incredibly dynamic this market is. With demand ramping up and developer inventory falling rapidly, it's becoming increasingly hard to source high quality credits for the market. And operating in a market with such limited transparency, without reliable information on the underlying quality of credits, it becomes increasingly likely that stakeholders will make decisions they later come to regret. And with that in mind, I think it's time for us to kick off our panel. Brilliant. Thanks, Ollie. Um, really, really appreciate that analysis. And um, just, just to give you a heads up, we're going to do a Q&A session. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, you can see the Q&A button down in the right. And if you want to start um, popping questions in there, then I can start selecting uh, some, some interesting ones to discuss later on. Um, but firstly, I'm really excited to introduce a few customers and friends of Silvera who are going to join us on the, on the panel today. Uh, we've got Anna Uria from um, Respira. She's the CEO of Respira. Angela Foster Rice, uh, the SVP of Strategic Business Development at Evelyn's. Our very own Ben Rattenbury, VP of Policy at Silvera. 
and Ian McKay, uh, Global Head of Carbon Offsets at Cargill. Um, guys, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'll just get, give you all a moment to get up on the on the panel, um, but I, I want to kick off with quite a general question to, to all the panelists, and I'll ask you this question in turn. But it'd be re really great if you could just tell me a little bit more about your respective roles, so what you do in your roles, how you're engaging with the carbon markets today, and and really what it, what would be great to hear about is like what have you seen change over the last six to twelve months with this this real change in the, the market dynamics? Um, Anna, wh why don't you kick us off? Yes, no, great. Hi, thank you, everybody, and thank you for having me on the panel today. Um, my name is Anna Aurie. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Respira International. Respira is an impact-driven carbon finance solutions business, and our goal is to make a positive contribution by supporting nature-based solutions as a way of combating um, and mitigating climate change. And we do this by um, entering into guaranteed purchase agreements with, per with um, project developers. Um, we buy their carbon credits at a guaranteed floor price, but then we also enter into new profit sharing arrangements with them so that they also get to participate in you know, the sort of growing um, prices of carbon that we expect to see coming into the future. So coming, Oli, to you know, one of the points that you were making in your presentation as to where the, you know, the sort of buyers um, were coming from, one, financial speculators and, and, and two, corporates you know, seeking to hedge their price risk. I would say that we're very much on the side of the project developers and we're seeking to maximize their revenues. Um, and this is therefore a win-win for, for everybody concerned. Um, we're putting a proper price on carbon. We're creating the economic, economic incentives that are required to preserve um, ecosystem services. We, um, the other function that we're also um, playing, which is a really important one, is you know, channeling private capital from, from, from from the north to the global south. We raise institutional capital from investors and we put this into investment vehicles. And it is that institutional capital that we're using to underwrite the um, long-term offtake agreements. So we act as principal, we buy the credits, they sit on our balance sheet. And then we work with corporates um, who you know, have their own strategies for um, decarbonization, net zero pathways or whatever it might be. And they're using carbon credits as a complementary tool in this transition towards net zero. Amazing. Thanks, Anna. And, 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 and in terms of the, the, the changes in the market dynamics over the last year, how, how have those affected you? Have, you, how have you, you, you know, witnessed that in practice? Sure. I mean, I think, you know, our, our thesis is, is the one that um, is playing out. So when we first started Respira three years ago, we essentially saw that there was a very important role for, for carbon finance solutions. And, you know, at the time, I think the only long term off takers in the, in the marketplace were the oil and gas companies. And we wanted to come in with a very differentiated model, which is the one that I have just described. And I think that, you know, in the last sort of three years, we have seen you know, real acceptance that um, um, climate change is really it's happening, you know, that whole sort of whole, whole debate that we had um, 10 years ago or 15 years ago where you had the naysayers and the believers has really gone away and there's a real imperative to take action and this has been, you know, not just only a, a top-down reporting regulatory um, pressures but it's been a bottom-up groundswell of um, support and imperative and um, you know, and I would say that actually one of the really important achievements of, 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 of Greta, for example, is to really awaken that awareness that we actually have to do something. And this has put real pressure on corporations to take action on, on climate. So I think that that has, been a, that has been a real big step change. Brilliant. Well, th thank you so much for sharing that. And Angela, uh, it'd be great to hear a little bit about your role because you, you're also working you know, very closely with developers and also speaking with, with corporates on a daily basis about, about their needs. So lovely to hear um, some of your perspectives. Yes, thanks, Sam. So I'm with Everland and we sit uh, right in between the project developers and the buyers. And we work for the project developers. We basically work with a handful that we consider some of the, the best in class that have the right mission, um, that have the right model of change, because we work specifically around prevention of deforestation. So we're, we're working with projects in Latin America and Asia and um, in Africa. And so what we do is um, we're the marketing arm of the projects. And so we, we, do, we do put them um, through our own due diligence process. We expect them to meet the highest standards. We also do our own review. And we really look to make sure that they have the, the best um, 
and benefit sharing um, in empowerment and agency of the communities and decision making um, and how they're working with governments to make sure that they're aligning with government policies and not operating outside of that among a whole host of other, other pieces, including deep looks at their carbon accounting, some of the basics, and all the projects we represent are deep in, they're in carbon rich areas, they are have, they have wildlife, biodiversity, protection, and they have forest communities that rely on those forests. And so, so we do a lot of looking at the model of change to ensure those forests are going to be protected in, a, in the long term that you're creating durable conservation. Um, so what we do, we find partners for these, 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 for these forest communities. We help make sure that there's agreements, preferably long-term agreements, so that they really are partnering with communities in long-term and really see the impact that they're driving in that landscape with those communities. Um, and then we support the, the buyers around if there are, say, crisis communications or questions about it, how it fits within certain standards and methodologies and how things are evolving on a policy side. So they feel um, well, well uh, protected from different changes in the market. Um, and, and in addition to buyers for existing projects, we also support finding financing for new projects. That's been something that's been incredibly satisfying is now that we're seeing the market change, we mm. have opportunity to bring money to forests that are under threat that have not had the opportunity to have projects there. As so we've been able um, to find financing for 20 new projects and we're working to find financing for, for another 20. So I think that's, that's absolutely incredible. Um, in terms of what we've seen in the last year, I think we've seen a significant increase in buying. And I think, you know, it, particularly around nature-based solutions, the recognition that companies see nature-based as into, integral to their own climate change strategies, if they, even if they hadn't seen it before, you know, understanding that if we don't essentially stop deforestation, we won't meet our Paris targets. And the necess necessity of reducing carbon now rather than later, that time value of carbon, the fact that carbon emitted today will, will create more damage long-term. And so while you continue to do your technology work to reduce your own emissions, the necessity of looking outside of your supply chain to also reduce emissions from a broader climate change leadership. So we've seen a, a significant um, demand. And we've also seen that um, companies are going farther up in this in the development chain mm -hmm. so they can secure um, access to high quality projects. So more engagement, more forward agreements. Um, so I'll stop there. I think I think it's been incredible and I expect we'll we'll be seeing more of it. But I'll say my further remarks. No, that's awesome. And I, one thing I did just want to dig into a bit more in, in terms of what you're talking about there, because I think, as you said, safe to say you've received a huge influx of interest from corporates, but the, what you were talking about there in terms of the upstream activity at the project developer, and that's less visible to the market, I think, because obviously it's right. not showing up in these registries. Can you talk to me a little bit more about kind of how much of a shift that represents? So you said, yeah. you know, 20 projects funded, 20 more coming down yeah. the line. In terms of what you've seen in, say, for example, the last five to 10 years, how much of a shift does this represent? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And, and it, it, um, it provides a wonderful opportunity for these projects to know that they can develop long-term plans for their long-term durable conservation. There's a lot more activity in going upstream for sure, um, which means, and, and that's both in regard to new projects and in regard to existing projects to create you know, uh, forward agreements for multiple years that would then, for new issuances, you know, that would be supply that's been purchased. So I do think that's that's a significantly growing area for, so I think there are going to be, there, there, there will be some, some changes in terms of what's bought spot versus what's bought, um, you know, earlier up in the supply chain. Um, but in terms of percentages, you know, I can't really comment on that. I mean, obviously some of those buyers are organizations that would then buy and sell in the secondary market. So it's not that it wouldn't be available for spot, um, but obviously that'd be at a higher price because there would be a need to, for those organizations to, to make money, of course. Yeah. Okay, that, that's really interesting. And then Ian, like you have, I, I think, quite a different perspective in the market in terms of where, where you're sat. So could you, could you give us a bit of an overview as to how you, you engage in the market and, and what you've seen over the last year? Sure, yeah, Sam, um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I would say we, we sit probably more in the risk management um, space, 
and um, cargo is a, a very big commodity trader. We operate all over the world um, and we are deeply connected to the land users in many of these different parts, whether it be South America, Indonesia, um, Southeast Asia. So um, what, one of our, uh, what we've done over the last, say, two and a half years is really um, built, a, built a large portfolio, um, probably about, I would say, the third or fourth biggest in the market in terms of volume of many different types of carbon credits. Um, we have focused primarily around nature-based credits. Um, one, we, we think that these, um, the fact that they have the biodiversity element as well as the climate change element is, 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 is a real, real benefit. Um, and two, we felt they were probably undervalued considering how close they were to the renewable um, credits um, two or three years ago. So um, yeah, we've got a, a large portfolio from all over the world really with many different types, whether it's reforestation, afforestation, red plus, um, renewable energy, solar, wind, um, the lot. And um, we're now starting to, like many, um, let's say traders in this market, probably move more closer to the project developer side of things um, and working with our farmers and suppliers around the world to actually figure out um, what, what they're looking for from the carbon market. Because many farmers and landowners around the world approach Cargill and say, um, yeah, how can, how can I sell my ecosystem services? So we're trying to get a solution there as well. In, in terms of how it's changed um, in the last 12, 12 months, from a trader's perspective or a financial trader's perspective, it's, um, it's a different world really. I would say 12 months ago, it was, it was definitely a, a buyer's market. Um, the bid offers could sit on uh, sit around for months almost, um, and you had no no you could go away as a team and deliberate for weeks on end, and then go back and and then you know you'd still get your deal, and then um, it, it, it basically had very few platforms, limited price information, um, it was very um, untransparent and hard to find out what's going on in the market, and yeah, it's almost turned on its head. To, to a certain degree. Um, the CBL guys are doing a fantastic job at bringing um, more liquidity around certain products, which, which definitely helps. Um, obviously, Silvera, who I've been a big fan of from day one, are, are really helping from the, the quality perspective side of things. And then there's a ton of brokers that have um, come into this market as well um, that traditionally have maybe um, brokered other energy type products um, and now a, a brokering voluntary carbon, and they're also helping price transparency um, on top of that. So, yeah, if you if you ring a project developer today, 99% of the time they're out of spot um, contracts. It's definitely a seller's market. Um, and if you want to get the best deals, if you want to work with the best um, for, for, for these developers, you need to bring something else, whether it's pre-finance, whether it's offtake. Um, whether it's a better marketing solution. So it's great that that, that evolution has happened, really. Um, secondly, the amount of money and interest as well. So when we first started, it was very much, um, I would say, environmental consultants like the South Poles of this world um, or, or, or whatnot, who, who were the drivers of this market. That has began, begun to turn a bit. You, you, like you mentioned, you've got hedge funds, you've got private equity firms, you've got big corporates deploying a lot of capital in here and actually beginning to take equity stakes in these developers as well. So, um, I mean, that's anything that scales this market and, and improves its um, infrastructure and its quality, I think is a positive thing. So um, it's, it's changed. We've got two um, CME future contracts to, to trade as well alongside the CBL benchmark. So it's really a different world from 12 months ago and very different from even six months ago. Yeah, and, and how have you adapted to that pace of change? Because as you said, I, I remember when even we entered the market, it, there'd be these RFPs that would sit around, there'd be the multi-month processes, and that just isn't really possible these days. Like, how have you adapted to that speed of execution that's now required? I think as, you know, as someone who's trying to capture opportunities in the market, as well as um, see, promote our farmers and, and whatnot, you've always got to be evolving because... And an opportunity that was around, say, 12 months ago is very different from the one today. And you, you clearly, the, the, something that was working or, or 
if you saw value in say forward purchases or spot purchases six months ago, there might be a very different um, opportunity in the market today. So I think you've got to be really connected essentially because you know it's, it's exploding. The number of platforms that um, open up um, almost on a weekly basis, you've got to be aware of the prices in all these markets. You've got to be connected to demand as well because eventually it will someone's got to retire the credit that's hopefully where where the drivers come from so i think um as 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 someone operating kind of in the middle managing risk in this space it's it's really important from from our side to to be totally aware of everything that's going on as much as we can awesome thanks thanks Ian. And, and ben a lot has changed in the policy space in the last year as well as this kind of market dynamic um, aspect as well. I mean, we we, we were at COP six in uh, COP twenty six in in November, but you know other other pieces have changed quite significantly. We've seen, for example, the the Mozambique uh, FCPF payments. Singapore has made its uh, announcement around its carbon taxes. The, the the policy landscape has also dramatically shifted. What what have you seen in the last year? Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I mean, you've basically taken the words right out of my mouth. Those are the major <laughs> developments. But um, yeah, just building on that a little bit. I mean, Article Six was probably beyond almost everyone's expectations, actually, the, the clarity that that brought to the market. And that clearly brought a lot of confidence as well, which is great to see. Of course, it didn't answer all the questions. So there are now processes through the UNFCCC to try and figure out exactly what this means. There are a lot of questions, particularly around corresponding adjustments, which uh, which are actually very difficult to answer both on a technical level of how you actually implement these accounting systems, but also on a kind of practical level of what this means for, for markets, what it means for sovereignty, what it means for uh, these parallel markets at the corporate and the national level and whether they will merge or not. So there's still lots of big questions out there, but definitely Article 6 was a huge leap forward, much more so than expected. Singapore's announcements on their carbon tax recently also super interesting because it kind of heralds a uh, kind of uh, global carbon markets 2.0, where international carbon credits are once again eligible within a compliance market. That has not been the case for, for a while now since, um, since the EU ETS ended uh, CDM credit eligibility. So we're seeing Japan now also announcing that they're going to try something similar, uh, although there's still fewer details there. And, um, and then, of course, there's the regulators who are getting more and more focused on this agenda in the context of combating greenwashing. And then there's the whole carbon crypto agenda, which has not yet garnered too much regulatory attention, but you, you can bet your bottom dollar that it will soon. So definitely lots of interesting stuff going on. It's a fascinating time to be looking at this market, and I think even more to come over the next six to 12 months. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Ben. And you know, looking at the analysis around how the markets functioned and the, the drivers in price, I think a question that jumps to my mind, at least, is how much of this is driven by speculation versus actual demand by corporates who then want to, to retire the credits to, to, to make a carbon neutrality or net zero claim. So I'd love I'd love the panel's views on that. Maybe, um, Angela, if you, if you wanted to kick us off on in terms of what you're seeing. Yeah, so just in terms of, you know, what you're what we're seeing on demand, really, um, you know, and how much of that is really being driven by speculation. So, you know, I think what um, there, there certainly is that occurring for sure. Um, but those those entities are quite sophisticated. And it's a matter of I think that corporations will take more time to make their decisions on long term planning. And so if you can, if you have the balance sheet to go in earlier and to have it, you know, have it ready to go, those intermediaries will be able to support the companies and they'll be in the right position. So, you know, there's a there's a as a place place for that. While it, it can be certainly kind of on the negative side be considered speculation, but on the other, it's preparing to have that book ready so that when companies are ready to make their purchases, they can. So, um, but we are, we are seeing retirement too, for sure. And some of the big, um, you know, I think this year was a significant year for the size of retirements that were happening. So that, that is occurring too. But I think this year will be, this past year, companies talking to their leadership, um, expanding their budgets. We've seen that, that because of the price changes, um, you know, companies sometimes had to take a step back and say, well, this is what I have for budget this year that I've gotten approval for. I need to have longer conversations internally to change my budgeting based on the new pricing that's occurring. Um, but there certainly are a lot of other other reasons, you know, you know, for for that demand. Um, just the 
I mean, we've talked about just briefly, just the, not just the number of companies doing targets, but their ambition is changing, whether it's moving things up more quickly in recognition of the time value of carbon and the fact that we need to give due reductions now or the breadth, the growth in the scope three focus and you know pressure from governments to recognize accountability for your broader impact, which we're seeing that in a number of different places that growing recognition. Um, but yes, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of other things people would like to say in response to that question. No, that's, that's a really helpful insight. I, I mean, Ian, from the, the trading side, like, it'd be interested in your perspective on, on that question around kind of how much of that price uh, rise is, is driven by speculation versus actual um, corp corporate demand. Well, it's a really good question, and it's, it's something that we permanently deliberate in our in our in our trading team in in, our, in across Cargill. Um, and yeah, if you look at the supply and demand in this market, the surplus is increasing. It's increasing at a slower rate than it was, but it's still increasing. And it's kind of counterintuitive a bit to see prices going up when the surplus is rising. Um, but then you need to look at, you know, slightly further out. Um, and, and if you get, if you extrapolate the S&D out to say 2024, late 2023, then it does get tight and the market goes into a deficit. So that's one thing that I think um, is driving it. So the spec potentially are seeing that um, S&D tightness later down the line and are getting in early, a, a, a bit like um, happens in many other markets. And um, secondly, I think that um, speculation on the quality of the credit is another thing. So within the voluntary carbon market, you obviously have um, hundreds of different methodologies, whether it's VERA or the gold standard or whatnot. And there's kind of a different S&D for each of those different methodologies. Um, so the spec is definitely going long um, removals at the moment. And um, I think the spec also took a view um, and maybe two or three months ago, just after COP to go very, very long to buy up all those CDM sort of low, um, lower price renewable credits. So everyone is looking at it slightly differently. Um, and I don't think you can look at it holistically as a single market. You kind of have to separate nature based out from renewables, um, from removals to all the other various things. But without doubt, um, the reason for the price jump is primarily, in my view, speculation coming in and preempting that later S and D tightness in 23, 24, 25. Oh, so that's really, really helpful. And I think it's it's interesting that you know, obviously, policy and regulatory and stakeholder pressures are starting to change also the structure of the demand. And I don't know, Anna, is that something that that you're seeing and, and witnessing as well? Obviously, there's this renewed um emphasis on quality as well, I think that's that's coming out of out of the COP26 process. Yes, um, I, you know, I do. I mean, just sort of coming, just answering a bit on the, the previous question first, um, you know, I don't think we should use um, speculation or speculators or, or, or hedge funds in a pejorative way, right? They're serving, they're serving a proper function in the market. And I think the fact is, is that, you know, um, really high quality nature based um, projects that three, four dollars 12 months ago was, you know, too low. Um, so um, I, I do think that the supply demand imbalance has been has been responsible for some for some of the price increases, particularly um, on the good quality projects where there is actually, I think we're already seeing that um, supply crunch there. And, you know, sort of interesting in that project developers are now finding themselves in a position where <clears throat> rather than being, you know, price takers, they're price makers. So that's, you know, a really good position for them to, to be in. Um, I think as far as, you know, the, um, I would say that probably in terms of, you know, regulatory pressure and standards and um, in terms of how that impacts on demand, I think it's in a way, it's, um, it's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag. I mean, you know, I think um, the work that SBTI is doing in terms of getting corporations to set, you know, net zero, targets and to decarbonize um, their own operations, I think is really positive. However, I think that um, the sort of mixed signals that they're giving in terms of how you use carbon credits and, you know, that you only use sort of removals right at the end when you've achieved net zero, and then that's to, you know, sort of essentially neutralize your, your um, unavoidable emissions. And that along the way you can use um, 
carbon credits as you know compensation. But I, I think it's really muddied the debate on the use of carbon credits. And I think in a way it's actually a service. And I would say that it is you know so important right now that we support avoided deforestation projects. And I think we have to be much more proactive. Um, and welcoming, I think, almost in a way of um, letting those Red Plus projects form part of decarbonization, you know, strategies and compensation strategies, and for it to be actually a positive. That, 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 that's a uh, super helpful to hear that. And Angela, I'd be really keen on keen to hear your thoughts there as well. Yeah, absolutely agree with everything Anna said, and um, I think that we're going to see uh, policy um, and stakeholder views that will kind of cut both ways on issues and you, you create some confusion, but over time we'll start to see those things crystallizing. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's um, you know, it comes to stakeholder. I think it's important for, I, I know this is difficult, but it's important for leaders and companies to be sure to keep their eye on, you know, what are the drivers of carbon emissions? What can they do within their own power and what can they not do and look for ways to reduce emissions and, and to also kind of change the dynamic of the North and the South and the dynamic of how we make sure that um, Southern, that the global South is, is, is being, is being paid for the services that they're giving the whole world. Right. And so, you know, looking, um, you know, not losing sight of their broader context as you're making decisions on what offsets you buy, I think we, and we are seeing that, I mean, companies seeing what impact do I want to have? Yes, I am, you know, counterbalancing the emissions I'm having, depending on their strategy. But really, it's what what impact will you have on the on where the where the work is happening on the ground, where the project is happening, and looking more carefully there um, at what you're what what are you financing? Um, so I think that po policy is evolving. Um, I'm, I think that the work of the task force, now called the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, will be really important among other initiatives of ECMI. I think the comments on SPTI were really spot on. Um, and I think that the, the, the Article 6 um, uh, decisions that were made at the last COP, some of them are incredibly powerful. The, the fact that we're now seeing a recognition of the importance of giving, giving the right power and authority to the host governments around some of the important decision-making. And this really gets into that space of the corresponding adjustments and. And, and countries defining, um, you know, what do they want to keep for their own compliance with their NDCs and what amount do they want to offer into the voluntary carbon market. So there's, there's a lot going on and countries will be in different places. And that's something to also be aware of. Not every country is going to make the same decisions or be at the right place in understanding and um, the carbon markets and how to engage. Awesome. That's a, that's a really insightful, insightful view. And Ben, you've been having many of these conversations as well. So I, I'd love to hear any thoughts you've got, got on this point. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, no, really interesting conversation. And I'd love to say that I really disagree with what Angela and Anna have said, because it might make for a spicy debate, but actually I think they're completely on point. And um, if I could just maybe try and add to what they said, just in terms of the stakeholders, I think you see two contrasting trends right now. Let's call them the crypto effect and the Greta effect. So the crypto side, you're basically seeing demand being driven for the cheapest, generally lower quality credits, generally much older vintages. Lots of people want to get in on the act because they think crypto is where the money's at and uh, combine it with climate change even better. So think of this side as kind of fear of missing out or FOMO driving that side of the market. Then the Greta effect essentially is around demands for high quality, high environmental integrity with NGOs and increasingly the media really eager to call out companies who they think are purchasing credits from, from low quality projects. So think of that side as more a fear of being called out or FOBCO. So we've got FOMO versus FOBCO <laughs> driving market demand in opposite ends of the quality spectrum at the bottom and at the top. And so I think you're just seeing some really interesting dynamics play out there. In terms of how the policymakers and the regulators are looking at this, they're generally more on Greta's side. They're generally more focused on quality and integrity and particularly in the context of greenwashing, which is now a very big focus for financial regulators as a result of the work of the TCFD. So we are seeing, I think, hardening expectations around credit quality and uh, also hardening expectations around how carbon credits must be used as a, a supplement rather than alternative for in-house decarbonization. 
I'd also just make a final plug for people to look out for the SEC's new climate related disclosures and requirements due out in the next few weeks. Really fascinating debates going on inside the SEC if, uh, if you're following the reports. For example, there has been some talk about the SEC requiring details of any carbon credits being retired when offsetting claims have been made. So this would obviously bring a lot more transparency to the market um, because everyone would be able to see which credits companies are, are using and this would shine a much brighter light on credit quality. So keep an eye for that in the next few weeks. Brilliant. That, thanks so much, Ben. And hey, you know, in light of all of these developments, it's quite a complex environment to be operating in. So I'd love, like, the, you know, some, some, some people's views on, on how to optimize offset procurement strategies in light of, of what is becoming an increasingly complex area to operate in. I mean, Ollie, looking at this data, what would your, your immediate thoughts be? Yeah, I think I'd echo some of the uh, previous points the panelists made. Like, I think uh, focusing on quality is really, really important. Um, and the part which is actually makes this so messy and so confusing um, is that the, the, the obvious thing that you'd want to do as a buyer is go, okay, well, let's just go buy the most expensive credits on the market and therefore I'll be buying the best. But actually what, our, uh, what the data we're seeing is revealing is that's just not true right now. P price and quality are not necessarily positively correlated yet. It's, we're moving into that world, we're not there yet. Um, and therefore, you know, committing, making these transactions blind is just an incredibly risky position to right now. Um, so, yeah. And, and Ian, any thoughts there in terms of, you know, procurement strategies in light of, in light of the market dynamics changing? Um, yeah, I think that obviously the guidance that people, um, organizations such as SBTI or the Voluntary um, Market Integrity Initiative are coming out with in the next quarter or so. So th the guidance that they give um, can definitely help corporations um, be more knowledgeable about the types of claims they can make and the, the whether well, how that's going to be received in the markets um, and by their shareholders and stakeholders. So it's very important to understand the types of claims um, you can and want to make. I would say, secondly, um, there will be other things outside of climate change that are very important to your company. Um, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, nature, biodiversity could be very high on your agenda, um, transferring or, or, or helping the global um, south develop um, or helping communities um, in particular regions, um, maybe where you supply or, or source a lot of your um, raw ingredients. So. I think lining up the what you're going to use the credits for, um, the particular story that you want to tell, and and really knowing, like everyone said on this panel, um, and something that Silvera is definitely helping with, the quality. Can you stand behind the claims that the credits are fundamentally making? Um, and if you can kind of get a sweet spot between all three of them, then you've probably got a nice project that, you, that you'll be proud to, um, to buy and, and retire and, and make that claim. Awesome, thank you. Now I'm really curious, so I wanna get uh, to finish everyone's hot take on where, we, where they think we're gonna be at the end of 2022 in the market. Now I wanna keep this short because I wanted to leave a bit of time for Q and A. There's a, a huge amount of very spirited debate and, and engagement in the in the Q and A session and in the chat. And I'm I'm sorry, we're not going to get through all of it. So we, we'll do our best to get through. I think next time we need to do a um, a, a day long conference or something because you know we 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 you know there's so much there in terms of being questions being raised and all of these are often very technical pieces that take time to walk through. So you know thanks for engagement. I'm going to try and get through as many of those. So everyone, could you give me your sort of sixty seconds on where you think the market will be? this time next year and then we'll, we'll try and get through some q a um angela i'm going to pick on you you can kick things off yes yes and i just i'm sorry to do the same i just want to say one thing on the oh. advice to um to buyers is just yeah, on their course. last question is just to say you know get to know people and find people you trust um because being connected is really important because because supply particularly of high quality is is limited um that you know getting to know people now and trusting them, knowing who, who you feel comfortable working with. Um, but, uh, but on the, where we're going to be a year from now, we, we you know, we are seeing a, we are seeing a dwindling supply. It will take time for um, the current projects to re-verify an issue. And then for new projects um, take some time, particularly there has been a dearth of really good um, experienced project developers because the market has been depressed. 
Um, so where we'll be from a year from now is, you know, we'll have some more quantity that has come on and new verifications and new, and some, some new projects will have started to issue. But I do think that supply will be down and demand will be up. So, um, and we'll, we'll see, and particularly around high quality um, offsets. And so with, that's all I'll say, I'll pass it on to other panelists. Brilliant. Um, Anna, do you want to, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, gosh, if you'd asked me this question um, four weeks ago, I think I would have said the same as Angela, but I think that I think that, you know, the sort of geopolitical events that have taken place in the last um, 48 hours and that have been leading up, you know, through the last three weeks, I mean, the potential of having, you know, war in Europe, I think is going to um, change the dynamic um, potentially. I mean, you know, oil we've already seen going through the roof, prices are coming down. And, you know, as we know, in times of great uncertainty, then it's risk off. So I think that, you know, this will have an impact on decision making, particularly, you know, for institutional um, capital. Um, I, I, I think it might sort of impact on a downward basis on, on carbon prices. And really it'll be a matter of how long it takes for this to, you know, to resolve. Um, and therefore the impact, you know, particularly sort of with European corporates and, 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 and the sort of secondary effects of that. I do think though that um, supply is going to be constrained. And I think that, you know, this is a sort of good opportunity to start to work with really high quality um, project developers and to build long-term relationships. Sorry, I know I'm going through over my 60 seconds. I really hope that um, the infrastructure though will be significantly um, improved in terms of, you know, settlements, contracts, the core carbon principles. Um, they should all be out by the end of the year. So that should, you know, further underpin the, the trust and integrity, which I know is the buzzword of the moment in, in, in the marketplace. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Ian, what, what's your hot take? I'll be quite quick um, and, and keep it quite analytical as well. I, I think that um, we're probably going to see a bit of weakness in the, let's say, the, the less quality, cheaper credits. We're already beginning to see the geo drop away a bit over the last two weeks or so. It, 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 it has begun to drop. And I, I think that that will continue. Um, but for like everyone's saying, it's so hard to get high quality credits from the best developers with good integrity behind it. So, and particularly removal credits. I think that the, the market's super short for reforestation, afforestation, um, and I can see that being definitely over 20 bucks next, um, this time next year. Um, on the, um, in, in terms of the, um, the, the, the supply and, and, and demand side, I would agree with the panel that, you know, a carbon project is not something you can just click your fingers and, and pump out more volume in, in the next six months. They take a long time to deliver. You've got to um, either plant forest in some cases, um, secure land rights, have long discussions um, and really go about planning it properly. So you're looking at maybe like a two, three, four year lead time on, on a lot of this supply coming into the market. So I think um, the right projects are definitely going to be um, increasing in prices. But for the lesser um, high, the less integrity stuff, I think that um, spec money that came in around the crypto wave will, who, who basically didn't know as much, I believe, about the, the fragments and the different areas of the market, they will try and look to sell like they have done in the last two weeks. And I think we could see some weakness in, in, in that going right the way till next year. Brilliant. Thank, thanks, Ian. Ben, hot take. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I, unfortunately, I do agree with the other panelists. Uh, a bit boring, but um, yeah, I, I do think in general there will be more uh, FOBCO fear of being called out. I'm going to make that the thing. And um, I think there will be a rising tide of quality, which will kind of leave increasing numbers of, of kind of particularly older and, um, and less reputable projects kind of a, a little bit behind, potentially even stranded assets. But um, I, I know that's a very loaded term. I also think we're going to see growing complexity and fragmentation in the policy scene. I mean, corresponding adjustments is one massive example, but there's also this increasing move towards kind of domestic and in some cases even subnational markets. I saw just today that um, Shanghai is going to have its own domestic kind of state level uh, carbon crediting scheme within China's national emissions trading system. So that's that's kind of the next level in terms of fragmentation. And that will obviously create lots of smaller sub markets and and yeah, a, a very 
a very fractured scene. And then also my wildcard theory for the next 12 months is you're going to be hearing more about carbon border adjustment mechanisms in the context of carbon credits, particularly given the, the recent statements coming out of um, senior politicians on both sides of the aisle in the US. So yeah, that's my hot tip. Grim. Um, Oli, do you want to close us off with the hottest of hot takes? Hottest of hot takes, no pressure, Sam. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, lots of similar views to what's been uh, already said on the panel. I guess just kind of following on from some of those points, I think this shortage of supply that we'll see over the next couple of years, I think it's going to um, be inviting um, uh, pools of capital to start to get more and more interested in this market and start to be setting up um, uh, more, more primary issuances, which I think is a good thing and we should be uh, excited for. And I guess the, the, the second piece and kind of copying uh, Ben's, Ben's take, technique of going for a bit of a wild card one, I think that the crypto trend hasn't ended here. I think we'll see more things playing out here um, as new projects get set up and that sort of new innovative uses of carbon credits uh, get revealed. Um, I think that could be quite interesting. Awesome. Thank you so much, Holly. Right. Let's let's go through some questions. Um, like I said, there's some there's 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 a ton of questions in there. So I, I'm gonna try and pick uh some topics that have like received uh, the most in terms of like uh questions. First one is that you know, an age-old debate, and Anna, maybe you could you could kick us off here between avoidance and removals, credits, and 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 how you think about you know how those two types of, of offset should be differentiated or used in different ways? Like, what, what are your thoughts there? Um, I think they're both, I think, I think particularly in the context of, um, of, of nature, I think that they're both um, really important. Um, the, the fact is, is that, you know, at the moment, the real, the real focus within the context of nature, I think needs to be on avoided. Deforestation is responsible for, you know, anywhere between 10 to 15% of emissions on an annual basis, I mean, that's really significant. So we need to create the economic incentives to preserve to preserve those forests. Um, so I think that there needs to be much more support, active support across the whole, you know, sort of spectrum on, on Red Plus, whether it's jurisdictional, whether it's private, you know, it is doing something that it is meaningful right now towards climate. Um, removals are also really important, but you just they're just not available there in the scale that we need them. Um, you know, we've talked about time lags, but I think, you know, to get a good removals, um, afforestation, reforestation to start generating, you know, you're talking five to, you know, five to 10 years. So whilst, you know, at the moment you might have demand for removals, they're just not there in the marketplace. And the, you know, the technological solutions Yes, they're coming down the, you know, yes, they're coming down the road, but at the moment we just don't have the scale that is required um, for them and, you know, and they're very expensive. So I think that they're both essential, um, they both serve, you know, very important uh, roles, removal is actually removing from the atmosphere, but, you know, as I said, um, I think avoided particularly within nature is a really important role and then, you know, avoided within renewable energy, I know that you don't issue credits because there's no additionality, etc, but it is still, you know, contributing towards that trajectory that's that's really helpful really, really helpful view and a angela i guess you have a lot of these conversations again with corporates is this a, a debate you're, you're seeing as well yeah i think it, it, it definitely is i mean we yeah. just um you, you just you, you're not going to have time to recapture all the carbon that's being emitted so this is the you know we read about irrecoverable carbon so you know our desire so i i think if you if you look at just a three percent of finance right now is going to to nature base, and everyone's probably heard that stat. It's it's kind of mind boggling because we don't stop the deforestation; we're just letting those emissions happen, and we won't be able to recapture them. So we need it all, we need all of it. Um, but we uh, we we you know, and I, this is also from a number of NGOs. We really need to stop deforestation. We cannot let that happen. So from a priority perspective, we need it all, but we we really need to work. To stop deforestation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Angela. And Ian, you mentioned the the impact of, of standard contracts. Obviously, we now got derivative like futures contracts entering the market. How how has that kind of impacted how um, players are engaging with the market and thinking about their risk and, and hedging that? I think it's been it's been a big impact. And if you've seen the rise of NGO and GEO and CBL, that's definitely been supported by the CME. One of the big reasons is that a lot of the financial players, whether it be hedge funds or banks or whoever, they're, they're, they're much more comfortable dealing um, with 
yeah, future contracts that they they know they have clearing mechanisms. They they have a system that manages this within their institutions already. Um, the the amount of money because of the margining system on them, you actually have to put down um, to trade them is a lot less, um, and it, it, it works within the current financial system a lot more clearly. I think inevitably having the infrastructure like a Vera account, a gold standard account, all the other accounts, it takes a lot of time and a lot of complexity to sort that out. Um, and maybe the, the, yeah, the financial community that is moving into this space is, is going along that journey. Oh, we've lost Ian. That's sad. Um, but, but, you know, I think we, we've got the majority of the answer there. Um, awesome. The, another question, we're getting um, a lot of, a lot of uh, questions around Article 6, the 6.2 mechanisms, so ITMOs, and then the 6.4 mechanisms, the potential bifurcation of the market when you're talking about correspondingly adjusted versus not correspondingly adjusted. I know this could be a whole session in and of its own. So, Ben, I'm going to give you the impossible task of, of, of giving us a kind of like... 60 seconds view on, on what Article 6 is going to mean for the market. Thanks, Sam. That is a nice big topic for 60 seconds. I guess it's, it's all to play for, and um, it's worth keeping a close eye on. I think the market will react to decisions that are made through the UNFCCC process quite quickly and potentially... Um, with, with excessive exuberance. I can imagine a lot of misinterpretation, which we saw during COP26, where people who are not versed in the details of UNFCCC, they hear something like, oh, there's a discussion around whether avoidance emissions will be included in the 6.4 mechanism. And they think, oh my God, that means that Red Plus and all these other project types are gonna be excluded. That's completely not what it meant. It was a very different, much narrower discussion that was had. But this is an example of where the market and actually the media as well kind of pick up on misinterpretations and amplify them within their echo chambers. So I would say, keep a close eye on it, but um, don't, don't believe everything you read. And when it comes to corresponding adjustments, I, I guess right now it's um, it's basically a question of your risk appetite, whether you want to go for it or not. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, now, I've got a couple of quick questions here, Ollie, for you around the, the data you've been talking about. So we've got one question here. Does retire at equal end of uh, the end user of the, the offset credit, which I think is a yes, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and then the second one is, could you explain how you measure developer inventories? The, 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 question, uh, the questioner, yes, the questioner, uh, it's not clear from you know, how, how that metric is calculated. Yeah, of course. Uh, so all the data is actually on the Vera registry. You can see uh, uh, all the different vintages which exist there, the length of time which those vintages um, uh, uh, are set for, um, and you can basically just uh, add them up and, and that's exactly what we've done in that, that analysis. Okay, excellent. And then I, I want to end on a, on a positive note because I think for me, this is actually one of the, um, I think really exciting things about the, the changes in the market dynamics. I don't know if Angela or Anna, you want to talk about um, what actually these higher prices are meaning for, for, the, for the project developers. That's, that's a question that's come through in terms of benefit sharing, what, what, what that actually means for communities on the ground. Yeah, I'm happy to take that quickly. We're, we're seeing it in, in real life. Um, you know, we're seeing um, communities that didn't, didn't have the schools, didn't have the healthcare, that there had been work going on to bring those benefits to bear, but until that financing is truly there, now these communities can make differences, the schools can be built in the villages, the healthcare can be brought, um, all the things, the long-term planning to really change the dynamic around that forest for long-term durable change, the model of change can now be funded. So it's not just protecting the forest today, it's protecting it in the long-term and changing, it's social change, right? And that takes a lot of effort and engagement. And so these communities are finally being rewarded for the work that they are doing to protect the forest. Um, so it's real. And what it means is that many more forests will be protected because I'm speaking Red Plus, it's the space I'm in. But now that you see this success, governments can see it and communities can see it's real, it's happening. And you see people coming forward and be willing to finance more places to have those same benefits and the same to the forest, the wildlife and to the communities. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, Anna, anything to, to add there? And then I, I, we'd better close up. 
Um, no, I mean, I think just from a very real point of view, point of view during you know covid we um we, we sent a sort of big check to a project in in tanzania carbon tanzania and you know all of that revenues had dried up you know because of tourism and it just made such a big difference and it was just it was tangible and it and and it and it matters it really matters awesome thank you so much Anne. well hey everyone thank you so much thank you to all of our panelists for for donating your time and, and for speaking to everyone here today and thank you for everyone join that joins Really, really, really appreciate your participation. Thank you so much for being so engaged and uh, for dialing in. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be hosting more events like this. So, so please keep an eye out on our on our social. Um, brilliant. Thanks all. Thank, Thank you for hosting. Thank you. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.